I'm sure all of you know, um, in 2016, um, we are told that there is a concerning school program called the Safe School Program. And this is a lady um, in Frankston who pulled her kids out of Frankston High School because of the Safe School Program. Um, after that, there are more and more news about what is going on at school. And this, um, as I told you before, there is um, a primary school student, just 10 year old, one to transition. Um, and Ross Ward at that time just went to the school and helped the whole school to support this child into transition. And I've been um, pastoring at that time, I've told my congregation, you know, I have two boys. At that time, they were very young. Now they are nine and 13. I told my congregation, you know what, there will be a time when my boy um, grow up. By the time they reach teenagers, um, 17 or 18, they bring back their girlfriend. There might be a chance that I will never know whether those girls are uh, whether they are biological female. Yeah. Well, that shocked everyone, but that is really my thought. A few years now, <coughs> do you think that can happen? Um, it can. So just bring it forward, that was what happened in 2016. But um, 2021 um, is a little bit different. Basically, the Safe School Program gave way to respectful relationship. Um, so this is the um, main program now that are taught in both primary and secondary school. Now at some point, um, the sex school program was only in secondary, but this is very much um, in primary and um, secondary. Now what is concerning about this? This is a report just released last month by Carol Sun. This is what it said. Even university research shows children are more aware of gender issues and bias. Mm -hmm. After six months of respectful relationship lessons and an overhaul of the library books and sporting equipment, analysis of the impact of the Victoria government's respectful relationship classes on 200 grade 1 and 2 students show improvement of the gender awareness and stereotyping. Now what is the result? Results indicated that ongoing respectful relationship education could be an effective way to disrupt gender stereotyping in early primary school students. Now, disrupt gender stereotyping. What exactly it is? So let's look at what respectful relationship is really teaching our kids. I'll just go into a little bit detail, but not too much. But I just want you to know what is actually taught at school. Respectful relationship actually grew out of the needs to deal with domestic violence. Therefore, um, the government put this um, program at school to teach children to respect people um, of different gender from a young age and also to promote positive attitudes. Um, the full name for this program now is called Resilience, Rights and Respectful Relationship. And you can actually get those um, resources um, in this um, website. Basically, they have resources from level zero, which is um, uh, kindergarten, um, to BCE um, year 11 and 12. Um, when you look at those content, yes, they teach um, our children to you know, um, manage their emotion, stress management, positive coping, um, and so on, which is, sounds quite good. But always when it comes to topic seven in each of the levels, it involves gender and identity. Now, what is it teaching our kids? This is a level zero, which is uh, for a, a, a prep student, um, for example. So they are teaching them in this activity, explore gender. Boys and girls can be the same and different. Anyone can choose. Anyone can be strong and gentle. Now, if you look into detail, what they are trying to teach these four or five year olds is that boys don't have to like blue. Girls don't have to like pink. Girls can play soccer or gun. Boys can also dance or you know go to ballet. Basically, they can choose whatever they want and whatever they want to be. Um, and boys don't have to be always strong. Girls can be strong. Boys can be very gentle sometimes. So from this little little thing from um, four year old onwards, they are actually teaching the kids to change.
challenge and dismantle gender stereotypes. If you read a little passage here, this is what it said. The early school years are a critical time to challenge stereotypes based on gender and other differences. It is useful to do explicit work with children to acknowledge, explore, and celebrate diverse identities. This helps them realize that their likes and dislikes do not have to be limited by their gender or any other characteristics and that their preferences and interests can change and evolve over time. Now, what we see is that why they put in respectful relationship in replace sex school program is that because sex school program, as I said, is only restricted to the secondary school. But here, when the respectful relationship comes in, it goes to little kids at young as um, prep. So they want to basically brainwash them with gender theory and identity politics. You will uh, later see that from a very, very young age. It's because at a young age, they can't discern just yet. And they would just absorb whatever the teachers are going to teach them. Therefore, they are studying early. Um, level one and two is about uh, grade one and two. Now, this is a concerning um, topic. Labels are for jobs and not for people. What they want to teach them is that they introduce the word gender and explain that the word gender is used to talk about the ideas that people have about what it means to be a boy or a girl. But these ideas can change over time. Okay, so this is um, concerning. So if you look into a little bit more details, what, what, what are labels, what are jobs? What is it telling our kids is that the labels are for jar when you label this is a Milo, this is a, sh a sugar jar, this is um, for salt and you know so on. But they are teaching kids that you have to let people know not to label you whether you are a girl or a boy. There is one activity that says if your grandma come over and label you um, um, as a girl, or tell you that um, playing soccer is something for boys, don't do it. And then you do have to challenge your grandma and say, no, I can do whatever I like, so don't label me whether I'm a girl or a boy. So this is um, sort of activities um, taught them. By the time they go to level five or six, um, they are taught gender, no gender norms or roles is actually formed by social construct. They are not facts. What this means is that in the olden days, um, how men and women behave, what their roles are, are based on the perception of the olden days people. Now we are in the 21st century, so um, things can change. So now in the 21st century, we can do whatever we like, we can do, um, or we can choose whatever we want to choose. So we need to um, step out of that traditional perception of men and women. Um, and slowly, what they are teaching our kids is that even gender can change is because it evolves over time. So in the second level, they are introducing not only gender, but gender identity, diverse gender identity. They are bringing in transgender and different sexual orientation as well. Just level five and six will be about um, 10 year old or 11. And then, by the time they go to the level 11 and 12, that is um, the upper um, senior year, they bring in a term cisgender. Does anyone know what's the meaning for cisgender? Well, basically, yes. So cisgender is male or female who identify with their own biological sex. <coughs> we are all here, I think, um, can be categorized as cisgender because I am born a female and I think that I'm a female. Um, so that is um, the meaning for cisgender. But what we are trying to tell our kids is that cisgender is a privileged group. Now this is not only gender theory, but identity politics comes in. What it means is that um, men and women like us are having the privilege in a lot of things and we are respected. But they are telling our kids that there are other gender groups in the society that are not cisgender 
and they are underprivileged. And they are the trans women, trans men, or those who are um, gender fluid, or those who are um, bisexual or you know homosexual. These are um, the people group who are underprivileged and and even perhaps oppressed by the cisgender group. So in the same level, they are also teaching our kids about human rights. Here, um, they say that it is important for children and young people to learn about human rights because it is argued that when students learn about human rights, they are better placed to defend their rights than those of others. Now, if you look at our young people today, are they defending others' people's rights? In a way, they are, but they are the rights that they believe worth defending. But for Christian rights, for example, religious freedom, as for example, is definitely not um, in their agenda. Um, um, in the um, climate change, for example, this is one of the rights that um, they are fighting for. I would say the danger of respectful relationship is that um, they bring in gender theory as well as identity politics and also teaching them the wrong perception about human rights. And at the end, I would predict everyone who goes through this level 0 until level 12 will graduate as an activist. So um, if you look at um, the protests nowadays in the CBD, most of them, to be honest, are young people. All right, there is one program that is concerning, but I won't go into detail, I'll just quickly go through it, is sexuality education. Um, this, uh, this program is actually compulsory and is embedded in health and physical education. But according to the introduction here, this is not about biology. A biological program. So it's not only teaching the kids about biology, it's more than that. So what's more? Um, this is the resources that they are using, catching on early and catching on later. Um, just very quick glance through. In grade three, they are actually taught sexual organs. Um, look at those contexts. Um, they have they will be given life-size female and male um, private parts, and the kids at grade 3, it's to label them. And moving to grade 7, they are taught sexual pleasure. Now this is one activity that I find very concerning. It asks the kids to share in the parts of the body that respond to sexual stimuli. Indicates body parts which may give sexual pleasure to either sex. They are actually given um, diagrams or pictures of the male and female um, sexual organs to do this activity. Um, in grade 8, they will be taught um, different contra um, con uh, contraception, and in grade 9 and 10, they will be taught different sexual behaviours. So this is um, one program that is concerning a lot of parents, and some of the parents that I know, they actually pull their kids out of those classes. So um, it's a matter of parents to teach to your, uh, uh, discuss with your teachers, when is this class coming in, whether they have this program in place at school, it's very important to keep up with that communication. Now, policy is one of the concerning bit as well, especially the mature minor policy that I have told you a little bit about. Now, this is a guideline on the website that say, the law recognises that as children become older and more mature, they are more capable of making their own decisions about a wide range of issues, including decisions about their education, health care and well-being. The law recognises that a young person may reach this stage before they are 18 years old. These young people are referred to as mature minor. Now, who determines whether our kids are mature minor? Basically, here is the principle. So basically, they can make any decision without our knowing. Now, we have all these radical programs at school. 
And later on, I will tell you that there is actually doctors at school program, which means the government is funding um, to put GPs in some of the secondary school. And these doctors, because our kids are considered commercial minor and can make decisions on their own, that means the doctors can give them prescription or referral um, to certain specialists without the parents' knowledge. All right. And then we are also having psychologists at school and perhaps some social worker, but not Christian chaplains um, or non-Christian chaplains that could also give advice to our children. Now, if you put all this together, the inference that our children have, and they can make all the decisions at school without us knowing, basically you will see parents are trying out of their life in decision making, and perhaps, you know, um, their whole life. So if you ask what's left for our parental rights, you know the answer. Now, I was talking about um, the doctors at school program. How dangerous is that? This is a report uh, back in 2019 by the Australian. It talks of, about where the GP at school comes from. Basically here it tells us that those GP is actually trained in the Royal Children's Hospital. Why? Here it says, the clinic has trained these school GP in the gender affirming healthcare or the pro-trans affirmative model, which sees children as experts in their trans identity. Government documents say it is up to GPs to decide whether children younger than 18 are mature minors who can consent to treatment themselves. The Australian asked the government how many school children have been referred to the RCH gender clinic by these school GPs. The Doctors Project complements the Safe School Program which is endorsed by the Royal Children's Hospital Clinic and tells teacher it is the child who understands most about their gender transition and mature minors may be able to make gender change decision without parental consent. Now can that really happen? Here yeah, it tells of the experience of a mom called Claire who called up New Mitchell's radio and said that she has been called by a school counsellor out of the blue to be told that her 14-year-old socially awkward daughter was a trans boy. The counsellor, who had been seeing the girl for three weeks without her mother knowing and had given her information about gender clinics and trans website. Now, it's very concerning. Let's get back to this um, diagram again. Doctors at school. So you can imagine what kind of prescription or referral they can give to our children without the parental um, consent. You could even refer them to the gender clinic in the Royal Children's Hospital. Or they could uh, prescribe contracep uh, contraception um, to their kids. And some, as we pay, some people told me they might put our kids to abortion clinic and transfer them them back to school without parents knowing, and that would happen. Mm -hmm. Now, if you ask, when it comes to uh, gender transition, how much rights do parents have? Here is the education department um, policy to support LGBTIQ students. Parental consent, when it comes to our kids who want to transition, this is the instruction. It says, if no agreement can be reached between the student and the parents regarding the student's gender identity, or if the parents will not consent to the contents of the student's support plan, it will be necessary for the school to consider whether the student is a mature minor. If a student is considered a mature minor, they can make decisions for themselves without parental consent and should be affirmed in their gender identity at school without a family representative or carer participating in the formulating the school managing plan. In a way, basically we don't have any say if our kids say we want to transition. Because if we say no, the school will make the decision. And I was told that you know some school um, the parents send their kids to school who wants to transition, but without um, the parents knowing the school can um, reserve a set of uniform 
for the um, child to change when they come to school and they have social transition at school and by the time uh, they want to get back home they just got changed again and return home so this is the support that school can give to our kids without our knowing now this is the um, operational policy for doctors in school uh, program so what is it saying here is that the GP, apart from the principals, the GP is the one who determines um, whether our kids are mature minor. Here they say if the GP thinks that they are not mature enough, they will ask us for, um, for consent. But if the GP thinks that they are mature enough, they are not going to ask us. But the conclusion is here, oh, here it says, general, uh, in general, all secondary school age students will be considered mature enough to make a decision to see the GP and so forth. So at the end, it seems that it's open an opportunity for the GP to consult with parents, but in general, they don't need our consent. Now, if you ask how far can transgender movement can go, as I told you all before, a law has already been passed for people to change their sex on their birth certificate even without any surgery or hormone therapy and they can also change it every 12 months so this is how crazy it is yes, yes. <laughs> um, so one concerning thing is um, the conversion bill that we all have been talking about recently um, so the change or suppression conversion practices prohibition bill has just passed um, in February this year and it will become law next year. Now, how is it going to impact parents? Under this conversion bill, it comes with a package. And one thing is that going to do is they are going to amend the Family Violence Protection Act. What it means is that any parent who doesn't support their uh, their children into transitioning into a different gender or they don't support or affirm the, uh, the children's preferred gender identity or sexual orientation they could be convicted of emotional or psychological abuse which is a form of family violence now could that really happen? it's a serious offence uh, because it's taken as child abuse. Now this is a news or a um, real story happened in Perth. Now Perth is far away from us, it's not even Victoria. But what happened to this story is that the teenage boy wants to transition into become a, a, a girl, but the parents don't allow him to take hormone therapy. And the court actually convicted parents of child abuse. And that teenage boy has been taken away from the parents mm -hmm. under the care of the state. Now I've been telling parents that if this happened in Victoria um, after the conversion bill become law, what happened to the parents is that they will get jailed up to 10 years rather than just having their kids taken away from them. That is how serious it is. Is it really possible for parents to get jacked? This is just a new, very new news just published recently. In Canada, a father has been jailed for not allowing his daughter using hormone therapy. That could really happen. And I think it will become more and more common now, not only in Victoria, um, but globally. Canada <coughs> is one place um, to start with. So if you ask, where is parental rights? Basically, not much. It's eroding very quickly. Um, as um, uh, Pastor Chris said, basically we are losing our kids to our state. Just for your information, I'm not quite sure how many of you are in my gut, um, my health record. I'm not quite sure whether you know, once our kids reach 14 years old, 
um, their health record is automatically separated from us. And once it's separated, we as parents have no right to access the health records unless our kids let us or nominate us to. So basically, um, if you ask for their health record or what they are going through, what kind of uh, medical consultation they have done with the GP at school, for example, you will you won't know anything. I have fa I have followed up a um, family who has a daughter who wants to transition, and that girl has been referred to the gender clinic in um, Royal Children's Hospital. The mom told me. Uh, whatever she wants to know from the GP, from the psychologist, um, she was she was uh, she wasn't allowed to know anything about it because of this. The, the girl was 16 years old. So come back to this again. Um, I already explained this, and on top of my health record and the uh, upcoming conversion practices, parents is no way in the life of their children very soon. So what can parents do? The very important thing is to build up a very good relationship with our children, to keep up that um, trust relationship that uh, you know when they come back home, they can talk to us about anything. That relationship is very important. And the second thing is to help our children to build a very strong biblical foundation. If we have young grandchildren, or if we have um, um, school age children, there is nothing more important than um, helping them to build this up. It's because, you know, starting from Genesis is where um, the, the foundation, where the creation is, and also where men and women come from. Without all these biblical foundation, you know, when they go to school, they ask definitely being brainwashed by the gender theory. But with the help of their parents since a young age, um, they will have some sort of discernment even when they are taught things that are not right at school. The third thing is very important is to help our children to connect to church. Um, young parents really need to know about that. And church as well needs to provide the family with good kids ministry and youth ministry um, you know, I th that is a passion um, in me is because I was brought up that way. Um, when I was pastoring at my church, my senior pastors actually um, put a lot of effort in teaching us how to raise our own kids and teaching us how to pastor the young family who have young kids. Um, without all these, um, you know, family and um, church working together. Our children are not going to have that very well balanced biblical foundation. So, um, Christian parenting at home is very important, but helping them to connect to a church is very important, especially helping them to build up a uh, group of Christian peers um, is very, very important as well. Another thing is to communicate with, uh, communicate your concern with school principal and the homeroom teacher. So if you have uh, school age children, uh, please um, talk to your school principals and say that this is the topic um, or the program that I heard about. Um, is that being taught at school? So how is it uh, being taught at school? I have quite a number of parents coming back to me asking me what to do. And one thing that I'm asking them to do is really go talk to um, the principals and the um, teacher. But I was told that um, the teachers or the principals usually threaten them with consequence. Um, if the kids don't attend these classes, there will be certain kind of uh, consequences. But a lot of them, I ask them, you know, um, ask for timetable so that you know that um, when the uh, program comes, um, you might want to, you know, skip a day of school on that week. Um, but the danger is that some of this program is actually integrated into certain um, uh, subjects like geography, um, English, mathematics, or um, uh, history. Um, sometimes we can hide, sometimes we have no way to hide. Um, but we'll just do as much as we can to save our children. Another thing is to discuss our concerns with other parents. I ask those parents to work together 
because if there is only one parent expressing that concern, um, there is uh, not much weight um, in that. But we just need to, you know, um, mobilize this parents movement and to um, make some changes from there. Another thing is to share your concern on talk back radio. Um, if we have parents like the clear the uh, mother um, who uh, called up new Mitchell's radio, um, if more parents calling up and express concern, um, that will be a powerful message there and, and people will get noticed. Another thing is to voice your concern with your local MPs. I would say this is very important, um, especially with those who have voted against the conversion bill. Um, they sort of understand human rights, they sort of understand parental rights. Um, if we raise those concerns with them, um, who knows, they might um, do something about it. Just um, for example, Mark Layton in New South Wales, he has just tabled a bill called Parental Rights Bill. Um, we, we know that at some point, you know, all this sexual program or respectful relationship is not going to go anywhere. Um, perhaps looking at how the Liberal votes for the conversion bill, perhaps even if they form government in the next election, they might not scrap all this program. So how are we going to um, protect our children? We are not going to get anywhere, even though there is a change in election. Um, it's really important that um, more and more Christian parents take notice of it and take action. But unfortunately, I find that the most difficult thing to do is to get young parents or parents with school aged children to um, take action to protect their kids. It's because they have been too busy with life and work and they, are they have too many things on their plate. But um, let's pray for them and perhaps starting from us taking action and letting them know what is going on, how serious is that. They might take notice and um, want to do something. Um, we used to think that parental rights and consent are um, respected or um, are pretty general and common sense. Everybody um, um, actually thinks that it's there and it's our rights. But now the culture is changed. Under what I say, this um, cultural masses um, climate, um, unfortunately, parental rights is pretty much eroded. So, under this cultural masses um, climate, we will see that when it comes to religious freedom and parental rights and LGBTIQ rights, the LGBTIQ rights goes on top and trump everything. So that is um, what happened now in our society. And, and you see that there is a lot of things which is um, very broad and subjective and open for interpretation, including, for example, um, the conversion view, how it defines um, what is change or suppression practices is very broad as well. The problem with that is that it's come to our culture again, there is no more absolute truth. In the 60s, um, the latest or a little bit earlier, so those cultural revolution or sexual um, revolution, those, um, so what they did at that time is very cultural Marxist things. Um, there is kind of a movement, um, a hidden movement at that time, um, that they are teaching all these um, leftist, cultural leftist ideology in university and all these graduates now and go into different institutions like um, entertainment industry, um, law, court, parliament, and, uh, uh, education department and all this. And that is what, why now, after a few decades, we see that boom um, is mature in order to make a significant cultural changes and that is what why we see there is such a all of a sudden change now. Yes, it's, it's a is a long march um, and, and they basically bear fruit now and you we can say that they are pretty much very successful. Now what comes next is that if we are just talking about Victoria, I would say 
after the conversion bill, they are um, about time. They will bring in an amendment on the Equal Opportunity Act, which is going to take away the religious exemption um, from religious school, Christian school, for example. They did that back in 2016, but that bill has been defeated. But this one, based on the Victorian um, LGBTIQ agenda, um, is very much in that plight. And the other thing that they are going to bring in is the anti vilification bill, tabled by Fiona Patton um, back in 2019, but um, has been brought to um, the, community, the committee's inquiry. And now the report has been uh, returned to the government and there are recommendations um, from the committee. What I would say is that you know, um, this bill is one that is going to stifle free speech, especially speech um, coming from um, the Christian's perspective about gender identity and um, sexual orientation and all these things because um, Fiona Patrick has actually proposed to put in all these uh, protective attributes into that amendment and the committee actually adopts most of it. So um, if it is being dropped into law and passes law, basically um, if you put conversion bill together and, and this anti unification bill together, they complement each other. Um, one is that we are not allowed to help people um, with gender confusion or um, struggling with sexual orientation to, you know, um, have another option in their life. Another um, um, side of it uh, from the anti vilification view is that um, if we say anything um, about gender identity or binary gender and people think, think that it is an offence, we can be convicted of vilification both verbally and online. That means what we post on Facebook and on other social media. Now, uh, this is um, what would happen in uh, Victoria. But in the long run, I would say um, there are many um, predictions going on um, in the um, world. So what people is saying that, you know, this transgender movement, basically what they want to get down to is not only to um, allowing men to change into women or women change into men, it's basically they just want to eradicate um, gender. Basically it is uh, bringing our society into a non-gender society. And um, basically it's just um, throwing all these creation um, um, biblical foundation away. Um, so it would say um, anything that is anti Bible or anti-Christ or anti-truth, they will just bring about um, having it implemented. And another thing is that um, they predict pedophilia um, is one that could go down the track if we are not um, vigilant. Um, they are starting to push that this is a kind of orientation, just same as homosexual um, or this as orientation. So once um, people agree with that, they uh, need to be taken as one of the rights that they can enjoy and they, they can legalize it in some way. So there is a lot of uh, things can happen from here. Yeah, um, about funding, definitely the um, Andrews government is funding that. And they have, you know, since his appointment as Premier, he has actually set up a new department called the LGBTIQ department, led by the um, Gender Equality LGBTIQ Commission. And since her role is established, a lot of things is happening and pretty successful as well. And all this bill reform, um, birth certificate bill, for example, LGBTIQ strategy, for example, um, commercial bill, for example, is you know coming um, from that department. And I think that department has very um, beautiful funding in that. And also this um, GP at school program is definitely funded by um, the government. Now I'm not quite sure whether we can put pressure on the treasurer. Um, they are you know, in the same boat, um, you know, agreeing with the same policy and no one Labour MP is going to vote against or disagree with the party policy. And 
to be honest, we really need to work work towards the next election. There is a hope. Um, um, there is perhaps our only hope at the moment. Yes, there are very good research in the past from different um, institutions or organizations that really point out that um, there are more suicides um, than before. Even those people who are put into the transitioning program, they are more suicidal than before because it's pretty much um, even confused them with their own identity. I'm not, neither here nor there. Um, but unfortunately, um, you know, the media is very powerful this day. The media is not going to publish anything that is anti-LGBTIQ um, movement. Um, same thing in Victoria as well, you know, for, for ACL, for example, in Victoria, if you want to get a media release out, you can hardly get one. Um, I got picked a lot and um, appeared in the Q News or the Star Observer, but um, hardly in any of the um, mainstream media. Um, basically, the media has been very left leaning and they are very selective. Um, anything that is against the cultural Marxist or the cultural left agenda, um, we don't have to think about it will be published. If you look um, at what, what's happening globally, why is the cultural left um, activists or lobby groups so powerful? It's because they have thousands and thousands and thousands of people making noises. But um, for the Christian groups, you hardly have a few hundreds, and that is the problem. Um, if you remember last year when Franklin Graham wants to have his um, gospel crusade in um, in the UK, none of the venues that he um, have won is because um, many of the activists actually call up those venues managers and ask them not to um, let him have those venues. So if we really want to make a difference, we need to start um, build up a grassroots movement of at least a few thousand people to start with.